The United States has reached a crossroads. The issue is energy, and the direction we choose to take will have a fundamental impact on all our lives. Down one path lies the continuation and aggravation of our present energy problems for years to come. Foreign oil supply cutoffs, price shocks, gas lines, these things demonstrate the degree to which we've lost control of our energy affairs. But down the other path lies a far more desirable future. A future where we can expect to regain much of the energy security we lost during the 70s and secure our economic, social, and political well-being. This will require neither miracles nor great self-sacrifice just some common sense decisions. The cost of our oil imports has risen from three billion dollars in 1970 to over 80 billion in 1980. This flow of wealth out of the United States has contributed to inflation and unemployment at home and a weakened dollar abroad. And as we give foreign nations more of our dollars, we also give them more control over our economy. This threatens our independence and lessens our position in the world community. But it doesn't have to be that way. Just as we never let others control us in the past, we can continue to control our own future. During the 1950s and 60s, we imported less than 10% of our energy resources. We didn't worry about supply cutoffs and sudden steep price increases. We didn't worry about energy, period. During the 1980s, we can move again toward that kind of energy independence because we hold the key to our own energy future. And if we do choose to turn that key, all Americans would reap many benefits in their own lives. Jobs could be more secure because there would be less chance of layoffs caused by sudden energy shortages. More goods and services could be available because more U.S. dollars would remain in our country for our own use. Inflation could be lowered and buying power increased because more money would be available for investment, which spurs productivity. Increases in fuel prices at home and at the pump could be restrained because the ability of oil exporting countries to raise world prices would be hampered. Prices of imported goods could be held down because a lower oil import bill would strengthen the dollar. Personal lifestyles could be more secure because oil exporting countries would have less power over American lives at home, at work, and on the highways. To move toward this energy independent future, we must do two things. First, continue to improve our conservation of energy resources. Second, increase our energy production. We must drill for more oil and gas and utilize our coal reserves, as well as turning increasingly to renewable and synthetic energy sources. And most importantly, we must turn to the abundant energy resource of nuclear power. This then is a story about nuclear energy and its future. But it's more than that. It is also a story about the future of the United States. And finally, it is a story about how one decision is going to impact on both. Almost half a century has passed since Albert Einstein, Madame Curie, and Enrico Fermi unlocked the secrets of the atom. Secrets that had from the beginning of time been held inside the element uranium. In an historic experiment in 1934, Fermi shot a neutron into a uranium atom and found that it fissioned. And that when it fissions, it gives off energy and two or three neutrons. It quickly became apparent that these extra neutrons could be used to cause more fission, thereby releasing more energy. Those discoveries ultimately led to the development of commercial nuclear power. 
But in order for uranium to be used efficiently in U.S. commercial reactors, its U-235 content must be increased from 7 tenths of 1% to 3% through a process called enrichment, which is performed at facilities owned by the federal government. The enriched uranium is then formed into pellets, which are placed into rods. Several hundred rods are then joined into one fuel assembly, and over 100 such assemblies are put into a reactor to make it work. In a reactor, uranium fissioning occurs, creating heat which is carried off by water. The result is the generation of steam and then electricity. After about three years of use, a fuel assembly must be removed from the reactor because too much waste, known as fission products, has become mixed in with the fuel, leaving the fuel assembly spent. But spent doesn't mean exhausted. Indeed, at the time they're removed from the reactor, spent fuel rods still contain almost half of their potential energy, energy that can be recovered and utilized if the rods are reprocessed. For example, each ton of spent fuel still contains the energy equivalent of 250,000 barrels of oil. At present, there are 8,000 tons of spent fuel in U.S. reactor basins with a combined energy potential larger than that of the planned U.S. strategic oil reserve. Currently, spent fuel assemblies from U.S. reactors remain in their on-site storage pools because the nuclear fuel cycle has been artificially stopped. In actuality, the nuclear fuel cycle should continue on with two more crucially important steps, reprocessing and radioactive waste solidification and disposal. And reprocessing and solidification is where the Barnwell nuclear fuel plant comes into the picture. The Barnwell nuclear fuel plant is a privately owned facility designed and constructed for the express purpose of reprocessing spent fuel from commercial nuclear power plants. Here's what would happen at the BNFP if the plant were operating. The spent fuel elements arrive by truck or rail and are unloaded into holding pools until ready for reprocessing. The fuel is then brought into a heavily shielded room where a shear chops the spent fuel rods up into pieces. The pieces are then put into nitric acid, beginning the process which chemically separates them into uranium, plutonium, and fission products. The recovered uranium would then be sent by pipeline to this adjacent UF-6 conversion plant and ultimately back to commercial nuclear reactors as new fuel assemblies. The plutonium produced by reprocessing would be temporarily stored in tanks and then used in breeder reactors or commercial light water reactors as a fuel source. Even the plutonium byproduct can be used to produce more energy. The third and final product of reprocessing, the fission products, would go to these stainless steel tanks, then to an on-site solidification plant where it would be vitrified, that is, made into glass, and finally, transferred to a permanent federal repository for entombment. The sites being considered by the federal government for a repository are desert areas and salt dome formations, all very distant from South Carolina. Now that you know what the BNFP is, let's look at what it is not. The BNFP is not a burial ground or disposal site for nuclear waste. Chem Nuclear Systems is the owner of the facility located at Barnwell, which handles low-level waste burial. It has no connection to the BNFP or its owners. The BNFP is also totally independent of the government-owned Savannah River plant, the oldest and largest of the nuclear facilities in Barnwell County. The Barnwell Nuclear Fuel Plant, Chem Nuclear Systems, and the Savannah River plant are three separate and distinct facilities. The BNFP was essentially completed in late 1975. Why has it never operated as a reprocessing facility? On April 7, 1977, President Carter abruptly and radically changed the United States government's 25-year policy of support for nuclear reprocessing. He said, quote, 
we will defer indefinitely the commercial reprocessing and recycling of plutonium. Mr. Carter, citing the possible proliferation of nuclear weapons, said he hoped other nations would follow the United States example by also banning reprocessing. But other members of the free world community, including Germany, France, Japan, England, Belgium, and India, declined and went ahead with reprocessing operations. Strong congressional support for utilization of the BNFP developed soon after announcement of the Carter policy and lawmakers appropriated funds for research and development programs at the BNFP in 1978, 79, 80, 81, and 82. During this R&D period, the BNFP and its highly skilled personnel have developed what many believe to be the most sophisticated nuclear safeguard system in the world. Many other important research and development activities have been undertaken at the BNFP since 1977, including significant work in the areas of spent fuel transportation, receiving and storage, and proliferation-resistant reprocessing cycles. This research and development work has been not only highly productive, but uniquely cost-effective as well because the owners of the BNFP have not charged the government any fee whatsoever for use of the costly facilities. President Reagan has announced his support for reprocessing, saying he would like to see the private sector handle the task in a more favorable climate for reprocessing in terms of government policy and regulation. However, the BNFP's owners, Allied General Nuclear Services, or AGNES, are convinced that government's contradictory and inconsistent policies, along with unresolved regulatory questions, have made private ownership of reprocessing facilities totally impractical. Therefore, Agnes has proposed that the federal government acquire the BNFP and that reprocessing proceed under government ownership. At present, a number of ownership alternatives are under consideration by government officials. To date, Agnes has invested over $362 million in the BNFP. The decision on the fate of the BNFP is drawing near at a time when the United States must come to grips with its energy problems. Nuclear technology stands ready to play a major role in that battle for energy independence. In fact, nuclear power resources are more than 10 times greater than our second most available energy resource, coal. In terms of energy yield, the comparisons are even more dramatic. For example, one pound of uranium will produce as much energy as 2,200 barrels of oil. As for coal, it takes 500 tons. That's one million pounds to produce as much energy as that same single pound of uranium. Having long been a leader in the nuclear field, South Carolina could be particularly important in the nation's drive for energy independence. The Palmetto State has been involved with nuclear technology for almost 30 years. During those three decades of progress, nuclear technology has done much to improve the quality of life for South Carolinians and contributed to economic development. Should the BNFP become fully operational, many more benefits would be in store for South Carolina. There would be additional capital investment in the state of at least $500 million over the next decade. Up to 2,000 jobs would be created for residents of the state. South Carolina would emerge as an energy-producing state for the first time in its history. The state's treasury would benefit through the infusion of millions of dollars in additional income and payroll taxes and other related taxes as well. And industries across the nation would know that South Carolina is looking to the future. The nation as a whole would also reap immense dividends from the full utilization of the BNFP. The Barnwell Nuclear Fuel Plant offers an important link in the commercial waste management program. Utilizing the BNFP for its intended purpose, with a simultaneous commitment to waste solidification and a permanent off-site waste repository, 
would constitute a major step in resolving the commercial high-level nuclear waste disposal question. Reprocessing reduces the volume of high-level waste by a factor of seven, and with solidification makes that waste more manageable, more easily disposable in a permanent federal repository. It is clear then that reprocessing, far from being a part of the nuclear waste problem, is in fact part of the solution to that problem. Finally, all of the individual benefits would in tandem serve to restore the United States to its rightful position as the world's leader in the safe and peaceful use of nuclear energy. At present, utility company plans for continued operation of existing power plants, as well as construction of new nuclear plants, are jeopardized by the continuing lack of progress in establishing reprocessing and waste management services. This failure to close the nuclear fuel cycle is a major factor in reducing the acceptability of nuclear-related investments to the financial community. In the long run, that would likely mean the shutdown of the nuclear power industry. Such a development would be a blow to the nation, for the byproducts of insufficient energy supplies would doubtless include economic instability and severe unemployment. Much, much more than just the investment of one company is at stake in the BNFP issue. Reprocessing at the BNFP would produce the energy equivalent of more than 300 million barrels of oil per year. That's equal to the oil we get from the Alaska pipeline. What the government does or does not choose to do with the BNFP will send a clear signal, both domestically and internationally, as to the future of the nuclear power industry in the United States. The decision on the BNFP thus translates into a decision affecting all commercial nuclear programs operating in this country. It's a question of futures.